When I was younger, and in high school, Valentine's Day gifts were really popular. It wasn't uncommon to get a lot of them for me, either. I was one of the popular kids, and I guess it was really in fashion to give and receive Valentine's Day gifts, even though I never gave anyone any. I was a hard-working student, really into my studies and my sports. I'd say I have a decent personality, and I was pretty good-looking too, so I guess that's why I got the gifts. I didn't have a girlfriend either. When I was in the third year of high school, I took home a bunch of gifts from secret admirers. They were all chocolates. I guess the girls had made them during cooking class or something. And as soon as I got home, I tore into them. They all came in these little paper boxes. There were lots of different and interesting looking chocolates. I saw that they used similar molds and shapes. There was one, however, that I didn't recognize. It looked out of place and slightly different from the others. It immediately caught my eye. I wondered who wanted to get my attention the most by giving me a bigger little package of chocolate. I opened the small handmade paper box and the first thing that hit me was the smell. It just didn't smell like regular chocolate. I got a smell of it before I even fully opened the package. I opened it and saw three pieces of chocolate. No notes inside the paper box, there was only chocolate. Something was off. The smell was really bad. I decided to break up the chocolate to see what was inside, and I am really glad that I did. Because if I had eaten it, I would have been in for a nasty surprise. Inside the first chunk of chocolate were thick strands of greasy-looking hair. There was so much of it, it was really disturbing. The thought of biting into that and having it in my mouth made me gag. I didn't believe that that piece was responsible for the awful smell though, so I broke up the next piece. This piece appeared to be normal. It didn't smell bad and there was nothing inside of it. I went on to the last piece and quickly found the cause of the smell. Inside that piece was something meaty, which was red and black. It stunk to high heaven. I dropped it back into the paper box and backed away from it. It was a piece of meat, and I only found out later from my brother, who is an avid fisher, that the fleshy red and black piece of matter belonged to the inside of a fish. In other words, there were raw fish guts inside the chocolate. Obviously, it was pretty disturbing, and there were some lasting effects that stay with me to this day. I don't like the idea of surprise presents. I won't eat chocolate on Valentine's Day either. The hair mashed into the chocolate was gross. The fish guts were even more disgusting, but the most disturbing piece of chocolate to me was the one that seemingly looked normal and safe to eat. I can only imagine what would have been in there. I guess in my high school days I wasn't as popular as I thought I was. This experience takes place a few years ago, and involves my former friend, Kanae, and her former lover. Hey, since it's Valentine's Day, why not, huh? Her boyfriend was a good-looking guy. He had a really good job in a big company, but the problem was, he was married with two kids. In other words, she was having an affair. But she was really happy with it. I guess she felt it was all fine. It was kind of awful, but she was sure she could steal him away from his family, or at least extort him. She hatched a plan. She wanted to engineer a situation where he broke up with his wife and left his family. Therefore, his adultery would remain a secret, and he wouldn't have to pay any alimony payments if they got divorced. You can probably understand why at this point I want to remind you that she is a former friend of mine. She was pretty open about the whole thing, and I think she held nothing back. She even showed me his wife online. She found her profile picture on Facebook or Instagram, I forget. 
She would constantly bring up his wife's profile on her phone whenever she saw me to seemingly mock her and attempt to belittle her. When I saw her photos, I wouldn't join in on the bashing. I mean, to me, she just looked like a bright and beautiful woman. Maybe she put her down to make herself feel better, or to make her feel a little more easy with what she was doing to their family. Kanae was too much. I was overwhelmed by her daily updates and the spewing of her bare desires. I would have tried harder to distance myself from her, but she was literally working in a building on the same street I was living on. She was running her own business, and I walked past her store every day to use the subway, so she was unavoidable. One day, I was in the food court of the mall in our town with my daughter, and I noticed my friend's boyfriend and his family walk in. I knew them both instantly because of the way Kanae had been so eager to show me photos of them. They looked like a really nice family, like the kind you would see on the cereal boxes in days gone by. Everyone was smiling and enjoying their meals. It was awful being in the know. The father looked so nice and in love with his family. What a shame he was messing around on them. I was thinking of this while feeding my daughter her food. She knocked her soft toy off the edge of the table. I stooped to pick it up as quickly as I could, but a hand lay on top of the toy before my hand could reach it. Without meeting the eyes of the owner of that hand, I called out, Oh, thank you. I rose up to my seated position and saw a smiling face with an arm outstretched, offering me the toy. She was beautiful and bright looking. I knew that face. It was his wife the woman I had seen in the photos online. My friend was having an affair with her husband and she was right here in front of me. I suddenly felt a sharp internal pain in my chest, the pang of knowing more than I should, of secondhand guilt or embarrassment perhaps. I pretended to be calm and reached out for my daughter's toy and I thanked the woman. The woman replied with not a uh, you're welcome but in a low and deliberate tone, she warned. Tell Kane to watch out. I felt my blood burn cold. How did she know? I was at a loss for words. She placed the stuffed toy back in my hand, but I felt something else drop onto my palm. She smiled and turned back to her table. Their family went on laughing and enjoying their day. Meanwhile, my palms were sweating and my heart was palpitating. I placed the stuffed toy back on the table and fearfully looked at what had been dropped on my palm. I saw a few neatly folded pieces of paper there. I was freaked out but also incredibly curious. I needed to know, so I quickly opened them. Written in small print was Kanae's address, phone number, educational background, work history, family names with their occupations and ages, phone numbers and addresses. There was also a list of Kanae's friends and all of their personal information. I started to shake when I saw my name there. My phone number, my family members' names, and my address. Well, it was the first time in my life when I heard my heart beat like that. I didn't tell Kanae about what happened. I was furious. She was bad news. I found out a little later that she sent my husband a couple of inappropriate messages too. So I was justified to get rid of her. It seems like Kanae and her affair was shut down pretty quick. She let me know that happened in one of the final meetings I had with her. He apparently was furious with the way she spoke about his wife. <laughs> Not long after all this went down, I moved away and of course I didn't bother telling Kanae where I moved to. I also blocked all incoming phone calls from her number. She was just bad news. There was a really scary experience in that food court. And I still have the piece of paper she handed me. Back in my hometown, in my high school days, I heard a rumor. It was a strange rumor. Apparently, a bunch of my friends had seen it, and many other acquaintances at school had too. Apparently, there was this floating white ball of light, and people said 
they had seen it at my school. There was no fear attached to this thing. It wasn't something any of us students were worried about. Quite the opposite, actually. People who saw it usually found themselves benefiting shortly afterwards. It was a kind of good luck charm, thus earning the nicknames. Thus earning it the nicknames Lucky White Ball or Lucky White Soul. I'll give you an example. My friend saw the white ball of light in the storehouse attached to the gymnasium. You know what I mean, a place where you put all the equipment. Well, a week or so after she saw the lucky white ball, her crush approached her. This was a guy who all the girls liked. He went right on over to her, out of the blue, and asked for her phone number. There were loads of sightings and positive outcomes. They all seemed to come from the gym storehouse. Someone bragged that they got Valentine's Day presents from a secret admirer directly after seeing the orb. Others said that they had guys approach them for dates and go from friends to partners. The numbers of couples around me seemed to grow ever higher and higher. It seemed as if only good stuff happened to people who saw the white orb. Hearing this, all the students at our school who were looking for a partner were rushing to the gym storehouse to see if the apparition would appear before them. A whole load of students couldn't seem to find it though. That was when it was deemed that only those with a pure and honest heart were able to see the apparition. Well, I had no romantic intentions back in those days, but it was kind of sad to me that I was one of the only ones who didn't see the lucky white ball. It felt a little bit like a slap in the face. Well, that all happened when I was young and in high school. And those were different times. But I'm still single, by the way. I don't know if it has anything to do with not seeing the apparition, but I have this crazy thought that lingers with me. I think paranormal stuff like that is more visible from the eyes of youth. And if it really was something that projected luck, then I don't think I'll see it again as an adult. Either that, or when you're older, you're no longer the owner of a pure heart. I don't know. It's something I think about every now and then. And it just made me realize that I'm getting older, I guess. Thought I would share it. This experience comes to my mind every time Valentine's Day rolls around. It happened a few years ago, but it still feels fresh. Back then I was in high school. I had a close-knit group of friends. We were all girls. We planned on making some Valentine's Day treats for our boyfriends. Well, three of us had boyfriends, but one didn't. She only had a crush. So anyway, we thought that we would bring our presents into school on Valentine's Day. I guess that because she didn't have a boyfriend and we all did, we didn't want to leave her out. It wasn't as if she had an ugly personality or appearance. She was just a, a little unlucky, and we wished her well with her crush. We were all crammed into my friend's kitchen with all our cookery gear. We were trying to help each other out. I mean, we weren't master chefs or anything. We were just working as a team. It was a fun afternoon. We were all just happy to make something for someone we liked. One of my friends chose to make cupcakes, another chose to make cookies, and I decided to make a kind of chocolate bar. Side note, mine didn't end up turning out so good. Because I made a chocolate bar, I decided to chill it in the fridge after the chocolate melted and was put in the mold. I didn't have all that much to do, so I went and checked on my friend who was making cookies. She seemed to be working hard, and she asked me if she could be left alone for a while, and I didn't mind. I felt for her. She was taking a risk on the guy she liked. If she was refused by him in front of the class, then I don't know how she would live down the embarrassment. So from her perspective, everything had to be perfect. And she, of course, was the friend who didn't have the boyfriend. We all decided to take a break in the living room while she finished her preparations. It was quite sweet to see how dedicated she was. After a while, I got thirsty. I guess that could have been my bad for snacking on all that chocolate. Anyways, I went to the kitchen to grab a drink. 
I thought that I would sneak into the kitchen to get a little look at what my friend was making. I was going to surprise her, but after I saw what she was doing in there, I immediately left the kitchen and went back to the living room. I saw my friend's finger dripping with blood. It was almost as if her fingertip was missing. She wasn't hopping around the kitchen in agony. No, she was carefully aiming the fountain of blood from her finger into the cookie mixture. And then she began to mix it, as if there was nothing strange about that. The cookies came out looking pretty normal when she went to get them out of the oven. I couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, I must have been mistaken. I guess I could have got it wrong. I walked home with her after we made our treats. I saw a band-aid covering her finger and I asked her what happened. She said that she just cut her finger while making the cookies with a knife. Now, I am no Gordon Ramsay, but honestly, do you need a knife to make cookies? Well, I mean, maybe after they were baked, but, but not before, right? I don't know. Anyways, I thought about that incident a lot. I managed to convince myself I didn't see what I saw at the time, but I was wrong to do that. I saw her squeezing blood out of her finger into that cookie mix. I wonder if she did it based on some kind of love spell or ritual or something. The love of a headstrong young lady is pretty scary, huh? All I learned from that experience was, I guess, to be careful of who you accept Valentine's Day presents from. We haven't been in touch since high school.